Welcome back to another week of Instigating with Clarky and Drury. Ryan Drury here with Chris Clark. We're brought to you as always by our friends at Cool Bet Canada. Larry Hudson's Chevrolet Buick GMC here in Listowel, Ontario. And of course, the Listowel Squash Courts. And we're joined by a very great special guest this week, Mr. James Power, the owner of Goalie Monster Canada. James, how are you, man? Thanks for doing this. Oh, my pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me on. Now, for those who maybe don't know... Tell us a little bit about what Goalie Monster is and what it is exactly that you do, because you do something that's pretty unique and pretty awesome. Tell us about it. Well, the long and the short of what I do is since I was a kid, I have always loved hockey and I've loved creating stuff. So it ended up just kind of going hand in hand as I grew up that I could never afford replicas. I could never afford any of the nice goalie masks and due to where I grew up uh, there was no real hockey league that I could afford to be in or play in but I was always I was always interested in art so it kind of just fell together and it, it just kind of came about that I liked making masks and it's been something that I've been doing the NHL ones for a few years now and before that I was making different stuff out of fiberglass and it's just uh it's just become a, a real passion for me and what i have consumed my life with it is really cool and i presume you do it right from like you don't just get masks and paint them you make them you have the mold and everything right you're right from scratch i do i am literally a one-man show i do everything and if i could if i could make the cages myself if i had the equipment for it i would do that too but i just mm -hmm. <laughs> don't have the welder and I don't have the rod. So I try to keep everything as in-house as I possibly can from making the molds and sculpting everything out, laying fiberglass, the paint jobs, making the straps, the shipping. Uh, I do, I do everything. All of what would it, how long would a typical mask rate right from the get go to finished product take you? Uh, if I had, if, if I had no orders whatsoever, if, if I had no, <laughs> My table. If I had one mask to do, I could probably to take my time with it, make sure everything was done right. I would do it in about four to five weeks. Wow. But even from four to six weeks, and that's with zero distraction. But unfortunately, as we all know, guys, like life happens, things go on, family, kids, dog, everything else. Nothing is ever a straight line, cut and dry. And unfortunately, it ends up taking much longer than that. And with the caseload of orders that I have, it's even, it's very, it's really stressful right now because I'm behind the eight ball with it and I'm, I'm, I'm catching up, but it's a lot of hours to get there. Well, we appreciate you taking a few minutes with us today for sure. And I stumbled across the site on Facebook and uh, obviously as a Leaf fan, as you can tell from behind me, I um I saw my Mike Palmet here, and this is the mask I, I know I showed you, but I used to wear this. I don't anymore. I've retired it now, but I had it designed, and it had my three favorite goalies growing up. Mike Palmet here on the top there, Wayne Thomas on the side, and Doug Favell on the other side. And I know you have all three of those goalie uh, masks on your site, um, but is there one mask that maybe is a favorite for you to make or one that's most popular with the fans, or is it pretty broad? Well, I'm not, I was a Montreal fan growing up, huge Patrick Waugh fan, absolutely mm -hmm. loved that guy growing up. And I was always a Grant Fuhr fan as well. Yeah. And Grant Fuhr in the beginning was kind of my number two fave. And long story short, he ended up becoming my number one favorite, as you can see, Oilers fan. Yep. Uh, the number one mask that I get a call for is probably my Dryden Target mask. Yeah. On when I check my website stats is always in a huge lead over the rest. Uh, myself, I like making a lot of the Grant Fjord masks because I mean, yeah. sure. So many masks over so many years and I haven't even got a chance to make them all yet. And every once in a while you find an image of another mask that he wore and it's like, where did this come from? <laughs> so, 
Yeah. Yeah, now I know that obviously you're you're an Oilers fan. You grew up Montreal fan, and you know Patrick Waugh. Who didn't love Patrick Waugh growing up? And obviously Grant Fuhr. Is there a favorite mask that you have, like beyond even maybe a Grant Fuhr one in specific? Is there a favorite mask that you've seen a goalie wear in the NHL that really sticks out to you, where you're like the design? The features on it, all of it came together, and that's a really great mask. Is there one that stands out to you, or maybe a couple that you've loved over the years? Uh, Ed Belfour's Eagle has always stood yep. out. I always thought that was just in a, a beautiful design with how they've laid it out. And Greg Harrison did an amazing job on that. I mean, he is he's a master. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did like Patrick Waugh's mask. That was a big favorite for me, too. Um, probably the Belfour is the only one that really has ever stood out to me where it automatically caught my eye when I was younger and I seen it. And I was just like, wow, look at that. And I mean, mm-hmm. the masks they make today are, they're great, but I mean, let's be realistic. You, you'd have to hold the thing in your hand to be able to see everything that's going on. And Mike yeah. Smith that he did his tribute to Fuhrer, gorgeous, beautiful mask. But if you never seen the pictures of it close up, you'd never know half the stuff that was going on in it. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's the downfall. That's the one thing I don't really care for with today's masks. The beautiful artwork, the artists are amazing. But I'm a humble guy who likes things simple. Yeah. The artwork is just, it's so over the top that you just, I find in a way a lot of it's missing nowadays. And I wish they would go back to simpler ideas. Yeah, yeah, I, that, I agree that, that's you. one thing. Yeah, I I agree too, Clarky. Like that was the thing about the Belfour Eagle, Cujo with the dog, Felix my the guy, cat, Felix the cat, my guy Oli Kolzig with Godzilla. Like that, it just there was one big iconic image on those masks, and you immediately associated it with that goaltender. And I agree. Now, yeah, the masks are obviously very insane. Like the the art is incredible. It's just it's they're smashing fifty things onto the side of the mask, and you can't really pick it up. Whereas you know e- Eddie the Eagle skated out for warmups, you knew immediately it was Eddie the Eagle because of the big eagle on the side of it for sure. Clarky, do you have any? I mean, I. Uh, Palmetier, of course, yes, but yeah. yeah. I was just going to show James one of my other masks. I have a few here. This one I worked at the fan radio here in Toronto for years, and we had a charity hockey team, and I had this one designed with the radio towers on it. I know you don't, I don't think you do your own designs, but this one was a neat one. I've obviously retired it; it's really old, but that was a cool one as well. And then, uh, following along in my career, I worked at Leafs TV, and I never wore this mask. But I had this mask done up, and again, it has the Favelle and the uh, Wayne Thomas on it and the Big Leafs TV logo. We actually used this on the set, and when they dis- uh, dismissed me from working there, I decided to throw it in my bag before I left. Uh-huh. I like yeah. this one as well. Leafs TV is no longer, so it doesn't matter. They shut it down. Bell and Rogers, thank you. Um, but I, <laughs> if, if, if Have you ever thought of designing your own, or have you? I have done a few. Okay. Uh, I used uh, I used a fibro sport style mask where I made a Team Canada kind of mock up one that I did, and it's mm. hard to find an image of it now because I did it years and years ago. Previous to doing all the hockey stuff, I used to do a lot of horror masks. A lot mm. of the masks did all the masks from Friday Thirteenth, and I used to do stuff from from Predator, and one kind of trickled into the other. I mean, I did that kind of stuff for about thirteen years, and I got really tired of doing it, mm. and and the community was very toxic in that. So I just got away from it. But back when I was doing that, I had an interest in doing the hockey stuff. And it was, I think it was around 2020 years. I don't know, way, it's got to be at least 10 years ago now, back with Team Canada won. And during that time, being a Canadian, being a Canadian I was really proud. And I yep. decided I wanted to make a helmet. And I had the team on one side and can on the other. And I did a big maple leaf on the front of it. And it was something that I designed that to this day, I kind of want to revisit mm-hmm. a better style blank and make a more up-to-date version of it. Cause I did like the design. It was simplistic, but it, it kind of popped and stood out. And I do try to make custom stuff myself, but uh, there's just no time for it. So right. uh, I'll tell you right now, there's gotta be 15, 20 projects I have 
just sitting on a shelf that never just never get tended to you know <laughs> yeah and, you know, get to you i promise i will do stuff but it just never happens yeah so, well we understand it takes a long time i mean you have i, I i'm gonna probably put my foot in my mouth but like a saw chuck one looks fairly simple from the outside because there's no painting on it right like an old terry saw chuck but then you get the ones like Gilles graton with that what is it, uh <laughs> some sort of animal on it right but it looks very intricate that must take you a long time yeah that that was a crazy amount of hours went into that just layering paint and trying to get everything to flow and then keeping the symmetry from one side to the other but yeah easier masks like i mean Sawchuck's mask you recognize it anywhere you see yeah, it you right. not recognize it yeah and that is easier to do and it is much faster yeah especially where i've some masks to save me time i've made a jig where after you lay the fiberglass and it cures you can put the jig right over the mold and you can just you can lay out where everything goes mm. with a pencil and next thing you know you just pop it off cut it perfect. out perfect and it, it saves on some time you're still doing things the old way because you're laying yeah. out glass on a plaster mold covered in wax are speeding things up because let's face it i'm making more than one or two of them at a time and it's a little quicker but other mm -hmm. ones where especially where you're doing logos and stuff where you have to print out stencils and be very intricate and measure everything to try to make everything as accurate as you can and even in doing that you're still going to get some guys that are going to come on and they're going to be like by the way your mask right. is you know identical to the original so uh, <laughs> you yeah, there's all kinds out there, James. There's all kinds out there. But like even flipping through right now, like John Davids in the classic mask, Rogi Vashon, Ryan would be happy to see your Mike Palmatier uh, Capitals mask, and then Felix the Cat, Grant Fuhr. Like it's just, it just takes me back. You know what I mean? That's the neat thing about it. It takes me back to my childhood when I used to, I mean, I still love hockey, but uh, – you know, and we talked about trying to design. This is the mask I use now playing, and it's boring. It's white. Like, there's nothing on it. Um, and we talked about maybe designing a Mike Palmatier for it. We're still talking. Maybe it'll happen. You're it's right. just so hard. It's just so hard to picture without seeing it, right? So, See, the, the thing with that is to do it before I would do anything. And this, this is one thing that a lot of customers don't, they don't know because I don't know if they don't feel comfortable asking the questions or they just don't know the questions to ask, but yeah. something like that, when I got it and I pulled it all apart, took the dangler off, pulled the cage off and all the hardware and you lay it over with tape and you draw out the design and I'll even go so far as I would take a marker and I would color stuff in so yeah. that you would see what it would look like before okay. I asked anything to it. Okay. If you didn't like it, Okay. You no ship sweat. it back or whatever. Or I get a Felix done or something like that. It's laying out tape. No big deal. So there's always ways around things. And okay. it's hard for a lot of customers to picture what a custom is going to look like in the end. But I do I do my best to accommodate everyone and yeah. try to try to keep your vision of what you want a reality step by step through it. Mm-hmm. Because it's cool. It's and like the funny thing, the funny thing about the Palmateer mask, like if you look carefully at it and see the maple leaves, how like bad they are, like they just were. They're bad. They're not like they're nowhere near what a maple leaf looks like. But that's nope. what he had on his mask. That's what it was. And that's what I want. You know what I mean? Like that's the cool thing about it. And it's awesome that you understand mm -hmm. that the masks back in the day, they weren't perfect. No. They were not perfect at all. They had imperfections in the surface. The paint was not symmetrical. Things yep. were not, nothing was, was perfect about it. It was a very raw art form. Mm -hmm. And I try to keep it that way as best I can. And 99% yep. of the time that works. I mean, you get some people that they want it looking like it's come out of a factory. And I find when you do that, it does take away from the rawness of that whole era. And it's it's a it's a lost art. And Totally agree. Of yeah. guys creating it and some of them are a thousand times better than anything i do yeah i mean if you ask anyone they'll tell you i'm a pretty humble dude about what i what i make um 
but there's some guys out there that they're just they're just blowing it out of the water with the things that they're making and they mm-hmm. look so much like the originals yeah that's well cool. james it it may be a lost art but you've definitely perfected it the the site is incredible when things slow down for you at some point i'm gonna have to reach out maybe get a holpy stanley cup champion mask the old Coles egg with the Godzilla. We'll we'll work something out, but give yourself a plug. Where can people go to get a hold of you and and access the website? What is it, and where can people go to get in touch with you? Uh, the easiest way to reach me, well, there's two methods really. If you if you can find me on Facebook, Goalie Monster Canada, it'll be the first one that pops up. Uh, if you can't, sometimes depending on whether you're using a computer or the app, some people can't find the message button, and I'm not sure why. But all you got to do is comment on any photo that you're you're trying to get a hold of me, and I'm usually unless I'm asleep, I'm I'm pretty pumped to get back to people. Same yeah. thing. Go on Google Google Goalie Monster Canada. It should be the very first thing that pops up, and there's always an email option on the page. So I've never Unreal, heard of- man. That's great. Again, I commend you for your work. You're obviously very busy with it. Uh, You'll probably hear from me in the near future. I got to always add to my collection here, but man, congrats on your success so far. The the website's incredible. And more importantly, the products you're putting out are incredible. Thank you so much for doing this, James. I try guys. I do my best and thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. All right. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll have Scott Crawford, our old friend from the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame on to discuss the 2023 induction class coming up next here on Instigating. Welcome back to Instigating with Clarky and Drury. Ryan Drury still here with Chris Clark. We're very pleased to be joined by another great special guest, our friend here, Mr. Scott Crawford of the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame in beautiful St. Mary's, Ontario. Look, he's standing right outside of it. Scott, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Like like we said, it's always sunny in St. Mary's, so I, I thought I'd stand outside the museum and chat with you guys. And the That's grass perfect, remains man. green all year long and everything. Eh? It's really oh, good. Oh, it does. It does. <laughs> Beautiful. If if you build it, they will come. You know what they say, right? Oh, all great. right. So obviously the big news this year, the recently announced 2023 induction class, and that includes obviously highlighted by Jesse Barfield and, of course, Dennis Boucher, Rich Harden, and Joe Witcher. Obviously a pretty great class going in, headlined by a guy in Jesse Barfield who continues to be a, a fan favorite among Blue Jays fans. He runs a lot of camps up here. I know he's been involved with Hall of Fame events before, and now he's going to be inducted officially. Of course, nine seasons spent with the Blue Jays. Um, Just tell us a little bit about the class and obviously how significant some of these guys are to the Canadian game, Scott. Yeah, I mean, Ryan, you started with Jesse Barfield. I mean, he's he's the last remaining fella from the, uh, the outfield of the 80s, right? George Bell's in, Lloyd Mosby's in. And so Jesse Barfield now getting in, um, you know, any three of them could have gotten in any order. They're all Hall of Famers in, in my mind and in our mind. And But Jesse, I mean, he he's, you know, he won the home run title in 86. He you know, won gold gloves, won silver sluggers. I mean, he could hit the ball, but his defense was outstanding. I mean, he's he is one of the best arms in all of baseball and baseball history, let alone just with the Blue Jays. And, you know, he's he's well-deserving and, and he's pretty happy to get in. I mean, but uh, we have a great class as like you mentioned we have four individuals and you know jesse's the blue jay player we got rich harden rich harden is from british columbia uh played mostly with oakland a little bit with minnesota and the cubs as well but but rich played nine years in the big leagues injuries really took down rich's career um he couldn't stay healthy very often he still threw almost a thousand innings in the big leagues with a 3.76 era so he still you know had a great long career um, he ranks sixth all time in strikeouts by Canadians and sixth in war by by Canadian pitchers. So when he was healthy, he was one of the best in Canadian baseball history and and one of the best in the game. So he's it's great to see him finally in the Hall of Fame. And and you got a unique person in in Denny Boucher. Uh, of course, he had a cup of coffee in the big leagues. You know, a couple of dabbles with the Blue Jays and Montreal, and of course with Cleveland. Uh, but you know, he pitched ten years professionally, so that that's obviously great. But you look at him more as after his playing days uh, or drawing everything together, really. I mean, he's been the pitching coach for Baseball Canada since 2003. So he's been, you know, he's been leading the pitchers in the Olympics and the World Baseball Classics and the Pan Am Games where he won double gold medal. Um, so he's done that. And he's also scouted. He scouted first for Washington and, 
and the New York Yankees all the way back for uh, 18 years now he's done that. So you take Dennis's playing career, then coaching career, then scouting career, and he's put in a lot of work since the, uh, since the 80s in baseball. And then lastly, uh, Joe Weichar. Uh, you can't say much more about Joe Weichar other than he's a, he's a lifer. I mean, he's 70 years in baseball in Manitoba. The fellow's 88 years old. He's been doing it since he was a teenager. Um, he's coached. He started baseball in Manitoba in the 60s. He started the Manitoba Baseball Hall of Fame in the 90s. And he just retired last year at age 88 after seven decades helping baseball in Manitoba thrive and, and be what it is. So our class is great, and we got a great group of people going in. Well, Jesse Barfield's one, obviously, that I want to dive into a little more because he was one of my favorites growing up. There's no doubt about it with Bell and uh, Mosby in the outfield. This guy, as you said, had a tremendous arm, and I remember him throwing it from the warning track. He played right field, Ryan, and he threw the ball from the warning track to third base on the fly. Like this, I honestly don't think the Jays have had an arm like Jesse Barfield's ever since. Do you agree? Totally agree. I mean... And, and one of the coolest plays in baseball, like lots of people like seeing the home runs and whatnot, but I, I love seeing someone thrown out at a base, thrown out at yeah. third base or thrown yeah. out at home play, the bang, bang play. And most outfielders can't do it anymore. They don't really mm-hmm. concentrate on their defense as much as their offense because home runs are sexy and home runs give you $50 million um, where defense is so key. And Jesse, Jesse had an accurate arm and could just, you know, do it all the time. And yeah. you, and it wasn't, you know, if you look at his D-War in the 80s, you know, which no one cared about or knew about back then, but it's obviously a mm-hmm. big stat now, your war and your D-War, O-War, all kinds of stuff. Um, Jesse's right up there with, with every player in his generation, every generation since. The only guy playing right now that I think, and, and I mean, with the Jays bringing in Kiermaier, they'll finally have a guy that's got a bit of an arm out there. But the guy that kind of reminds me on the defensive side, guy's a little maybe more talented offensively, but the guy playing now that reminds me a lot of Barfield in the outfield, watching some of his highlights and comparing him to this guy now is Mookie Betts. Like Mookie Betts has an absolute cannon out there. He can throw on the fly, takes a lot more pride in playing in the field than he does with the bat. And he's pretty darn good with the bat, but Barfield was too. And, you know, his defense, Scott, made him stand out. But you mentioned it as well. Like, this guy won a home run title. Like He's an unbelievable and underrated offensive performer throughout his career too. He is. I mean, he hit 179 home runs in nine years of the Blue Jays, right? I mean, he came up when the Blue Jays were coming up in the early 80s when they had the Fernandeses and Mosby's and Bell and Day Steve and Jimmy Key. And I mean, that's why the Jays were so great in the in the mid to late 80s is because they had all these guys. They drafted Jesse in 1977, so their first ever draft. And they knew he was going to be that, that good. And he was their cornerstone. I mean, he was their middle of their order hitter and their right fielder. And for nine years, I mean, he got traded for Al Leiter in 89. Um, but, you know, he was still the main guy through the whole 80s in uh, in right field. And like you see, yeah, Mookie Betts, amazing player. That's why he, the Dodgers are paying him X millions of dollars for the next decade. Um, but hard to believe Mookie was a second baseman when he came up. And uh, you think, man, he was probably wasting his arm at second base when you see him throwing from the outfield. But there are a few players, and those players are getting the most money because they're they're an all round player, which I think is rare these days, and but really important. Yeah, yeah, there there are not a lot of five tool guys out there anymore, and the ones that are are getting big, big, big dollars, and and rightly so. I know as well. On top of the class this year. There are going to be a couple noteworthy people attending the ceremony in June as well that were recent inductees that couldn't attend their ceremony. Tell us a little bit about that, Scott. Yeah, I mean, as as you know, COVID-19 threw a wrench into everyone's plans for a couple of years and and uh, ours as well. I mean, in February 2020, we announced our 2020 class and then March 2020, everything shut down, as we know, and for a couple of years. And so we weren't able to bring the four fellows from 2020 in. Uh, two of them were able to come last year, and then the two that we still weren't able to get here last year, Jacques Doucette and Justin, and sorry, and John Olerud are coming this mm-hmm. year. I mean, Olerud, of course, Blue Jay during the World Series years in the '90s, and uh, and Jacques Doucette. Jacques Doucette's like the you know the Tom Cheek and Jerry Howarth of the Blue Jays. He's a legend in Montreal. He's the announcer for since 1972, right up to the end of the Expos. He was their everyday uh, French announcer on radio and. So he, he's, he's got such an amazing history of the Expos. 
He saw every single game from 1972 to 2004. I mean, can't get more history than that. And uh, those two guys are going to be joining the class this year, which is great. So a lot of people on stage and a lot of Blue Jay fans will be there excited to see John and Jesse. It's going to be an incredible ceremony. Tell everybody the date, the time, and uh, all the festivities that are going to be included in this year's induction ceremony, Scott. Yeah, well, it's really a, a three-day festival we run here. We always start the Thursday night with a event called the Opening Pitch, and it's in Toronto. Um, it's sort of like a private uh, ticket-only event where we have about 100 people at it, so it's a great opportunity to meet the inductees and mingle with the inductees and um, and with a very small crowd. That's why we sell tickets. It's a fundraiser for us, and we hold it in, in Toronto. Uh, Friday, if you're a golfer, we run our Celebrity Golf Banquet, or Celebrity Golf Tournament with a banquet after it. Uh, so if you like golfing, you can golf with these guys. Um, if you can't take a day off work and golf, you can just buy a ticket for the banquet, of course, and you can meet and greet with these people. And then Induction Day. I mean, that's what we're all about, right? It's Saturday, June 17th. And sorry, the golf tournament's the day before, and then the, the Thursday night's two days before. But Saturday, June 17th, is induction day uh ceremonies at one o'clock uh get there early there's the museums open there's ball games there's food there's beverages there's auction items there's celebrities walking around the state rocking around the site past hall of famers are there and you'll see fergie jenkins and and ernie witt and lloyd mosby and all kinds of people that are gonna be there to come back to their stomping ground sort of thing as past hall of famers and um the event's free to attend so you know don't you don't have to spend a dime we'd love you to spend a few dimes but you can just come to the event and and enjoy it and, and listen to the ceremony and, and and the autograph sessions right after the ceremony. Yeah, it's going to be a great day. It always is. And uh, it's right there at that building behind Mr. Crawford, the uh, Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame, beautiful St. Mary's. Scott, I know you're a big ball fan, so let's talk some current ball news. Obviously, the big news in Jays land this week is that Bo Bichette has agreed to a three-year extension. Now, they haven't released still as we record this on, on Wednesday, February 8th. We still don't know the financial details of it, but it does buy up the remainder of his ARB years. And the the whole discussion around him up until this contract leaked was that he was asking for 7.5 on a one-year ARB deal. The Jays were offering five. Jeff Passan said that was the biggest discrepancy in arbitration in Major League Baseball this year. And we talked a lot about Jesse Barfield and how good he was defensively and was a pretty good offensive player, too. There's something to be said in there about Bo because we all know the guy can hit. He had one of the most unbelievable Septembers in Major League Baseball at the end of last season, but his defense is still lacking, and you need a good defender if you're going to be a shortstop. What's your opinion of Bo? Did you see him grow at all defensively last year, in your opinion? And do you believe he can be the long-term solution at short for the Jays? Yeah, good questions. I mean, I I think yes. I think you're right. His hitting is better than his defense. Um, I think his defense is getting better. Defense is short defensive shortstops are hard to come by. Um, there are again a few. Um, you look at the top defense shortstops in the game from Correa and Bogarts and and um getting all the other guys, but the guy in Seeger with Texas and whoever else. Um, you know, uh, I think he's going to be there. He's their answer. I mean, they traded away their other top prospects. Their top two draft picks the last couple of years are both shortstops or middle infielders, and they're gone. One they sent to Minnesota for Barrios, and, and the other fellow they traded his way as well. So they, they have no other answer, uh, but I don't think they need one. I think Bo is the cornerstone. I think his defense will only get better. He's proven he can hit with the best of the best. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, kind of disappointed that everyone seems to forget about him. They talk about the you know, the Kreas and the Bogarts and the Seegers and, and all those guys. And, and uh, the guy who went to the Cubs from the Braves. Um, you know, and they don't talk about Bichette too much. I mean, he led the league in hits the last two years. And he's an amazing hitter. And I think with this offense, um, he's going to be, you know, him and Vladdy are going to be the middle of the order. And we're going to need them to uh, hit like they have in the past. And I think Bo... Bo be the guy. I mean, the, by locking him up for those three years, I mean that just sort of sets the sets the budget for those three years. He can still be a free agency, um, hit free agency when he's going to, um, and he's going to cost a lot of money if he keeps this going. And, and the Jays are going to have to decide in a couple of years what to do. But now they're set for three years, so they know their costs the next three years. 
Scott, do you think we're going to see a major change this year in, in ball because of the rule changes, the pitch count, uh, the um, you can't do the shift anymore. The guy's got to stay on the right side of the bag and bigger bases this year. Like going to see more stolen bases. I know it's not a lot, but sometimes, you know, three inches or two inches, yeah, whatever I, it is. I think um, the stolen bases. Yes. I think the go up. I don't think a lot because there mm-hmm. aren't a lot of guys that steal bases. Uh, Not like the good old days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you go back 20, 30 years and, you, you know, Ricky Henderson yeah. would steal you 100 bases in the 80s. Yeah, I know, it's crazy. But, uh, you know, but the guys that do steal, like Trey Turner, who's with Philadelphia, and, and Mookie Betts, who you mentioned earlier, and and uh, Birdie, who plays for, I think, Miami. Um, you know, there's still going to be guys that steal bases. Everyone will have a couple more, I think, because, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. three inches on both sides of the bag. That I mean, that, that makes a big difference on those bang-bang plays to uh, right. second base. Um, so, but the guys who are just out are now going to be just safe. And uh, and the, maybe be able to get back to their bag, too, right? Yeah, on pick yeah off exactly. Attempts. Pickoffs and whatnot, yeah. and they're limiting the pickoffs, too, so that gives an advantage to the runner, I think, as well. The, the, the um, batting or the defensive changes... Um, I, I'm kind of torn with that. I, I think hitters should be able to hit the other way. I think I'm thinking Tony yeah. Fernandez and Tony Gwynn and, and Joey Votto and, and many other guys that, like, if there's nobody on the third base side, it drives me crazy. All over there. Um, I know it's hard to do. I'm sitting in this chair, I'm not in the big leagues. I, I've never come close to playing any of that talent level. But those guys are in the big leagues. They, and are. they should be able to do it. Yeah. And anyway. my, my feeling is like, you should be able to do it the other way. Again, yeah. any players are listening to me right now, you know, they'll tell me I'm crazy because it's hard to do. Um, but I think it's going to help the hitters. I think the average is going to go up. I think so pitchers' ERAs are going to go up. So I, I think it's going to be, you know, mm-hmm. the year of the hitter. And pitchers are going to be like, what about us? Yeah. You know, why is it, why, you know, you're hurting us now. Yeah. Well, and then yeah, and well, hurry up and hurry up frankly, while, you're, while you're getting lit up. <laughs> no, I know. Well, frankly, I'm sick of listening to the pitchers whine for the last decade. It's been the decade of the pitcher. Uh, it really, really has. When you look at ERAs that they mm-hmm. have never had a 10 year stretch over the last 10 years where ERAs have held as low as they have and consistently went down over a decade. That's never happened in baseball history. So I'm all for the year of the hitter. Like, give mm-hmm. me the year of the hitter. We want offense, but we want to see a varied offense. We don't just want to see the long ball. We want to see we want to see small ball. We want to see stolen bases. And I I personally am excited to watch the game and see how it develops with these rule changes. I'm actually pretty excited about it. Scott, I wanted to ask you, you know, you mentioned him as one of the better guys at his position. And I'm just curious what you thought of this because it was one of the most bizarre sports stories, let alone baseball stories of the off season. Have you ever in your life, you've watched a lot of baseball and Clarky, you have too. Have you ever in your lives, both of you seen anything as bizarre as this Carlos Correa saga in the off season? I'm going to San Francisco. I signed a 10 or 12 year deal. Wait, no, never mind. The doctor thinks my ankle looks wonky. Okay, no, never mind. I'm going to go sign over here now. Nope, we don't like his ankle either. Never mind. I'm going back to Minnesota. It was one of the strangest things I've ever seen, Scott. Oh, I, I agree. I mean, I, when he signed with the Giants, I was like, okay, I know the Giants are after him. I know the Giants have money because they didn't get Judge. And I thought, okay, well, I mean, I, I personally think the deals are way too long. I think the 10 and 11, 12 year deals are are, mm-hmm. for, are hard to do because you don't know what you're getting. I mean, let alone mm-hmm. tomorrow, <laughs> you know, 12 years down the road is really hard to predict, but teams do it. And and that's, that's fine. Um, the, uh, you know, from, as soon as, as soon as that went, you know, I thought, okay, well the Mets, okay. Well, I know the Mets are going for it too. Cause that owner has spent, you know, a billion dollars this off season on signing guys. And they got the highest payroll in baseball. It's going to be over 300 million, I think. Um, so again, I, and the Mets like to do that. They like to take risks and, and they have lots of money to do that. So I thought, okay, go sign at the Mets. You know, the Mets must like the, not afraid of the medical report. They must like them. And then when they balked on it too, I was like, oh man, I, I predicted, I thought he'd still go to the Mets just for like six or seven years instead of the 10 or 11 years. Mm-hmm. Um, I was surprised he went back to Minnesota, um, especially because he, you know, he signed a three-year deal in Minnesota last year with a, with a clause he could get out of the deal. 
um, you know, and that he did, he left, he left for more money um, by somebody yeah. else. And then he came back to the twins. So I think the twins organization is lucky to get him. He's one of the best players in baseball. Um, I think six, what do you six years or seven years with the twins? Um, yeah. I, I think that that make deal makes a heck of a lot more sense. Um, and cause he's proven he can play. He's proven he's the best players, but yeah, like you said, Ryan, it was awfully weird. I don't know what you think, Chris, but, uh, uh, it was, it was a weird story to follow and, and it surprised me going to the Mets and then going to the twins. Well, the other thing too, is that maybe I'm just an old grumpy guy now, but like, I'm done with him if I'm a Twins fan. Like, this guy wanted to go to two other cities. Oh, now he's coming back. Oh, now I have to cheer for this guy again. I know he's a great player, but I it's don't bizarre. know. It just, it, just, it just gives me a bad taste in my mouth about the guy. That's I cool. saw I saw a report Ken Rosenthal shared where an anonymous doctor that was one of the ones that did the second opinion examination for the Giants, allegedly that doctor said that Correa's got one of the worst ankles he's ever seen in someone his age. If that's true, I mean, like, if that is true, good on Scott Boris for managing to get him anything of substance. Yeah. Because well, I, think be he got se- I think he got seven years, $210 million out of the Twins. I mean, good grief. Thank God he got that for him because he is a good player. But if that's true, you got to wonder. Final one for me, Scott, you brought him up. And I wonder your opinion on this because it's been a divisive topic in baseball, particularly among baseball ownership. And it's the Mets owner. It's Steve Cohen. Old Uncle Steve just dishing out the pocketbook it's incredible the checks this guy is flinging out there a lot of fans seem to have a problem with him spending all this money and there's another segment of fans and i'm kind of in this team that are like no it's great to see an owner actually investing and going no i'm putting everything i can into winning and there are an awful lot of owners, including the owner of my Oakland A's, can still call them the Oakland A's for now, that don't do that. They do the exact opposite. Oakland's going to have like a $22 million payroll this year. It's embarrassing. Where do you stand on this, Scott? Do you like what Uncle Stevie's doing down in New York? Or are you kind of like, uh, unfair advantage? <laughs> Good question. Um, well, both. I mean, I, was, I kind of sit on the fence. I mean, it's, it is on, in one way, it's unfair because, like you said, the Oakland owner or the Cincinnati owner or the Tampa Bay, they don't have the money to spend of the Dodgers and Yankees and Red Sox and Mets and, you know, the top half dozen teams. Um, there is some revenue sharing, which helps a little bit uh, for the, for the other teams. Um, but, you know, it's, but I see it as uh, money. Money doesn't buy championships all the time. I mean, the Yankees haven't won since 2009. The Dodgers have one World Series, and they've won nine consecutive AL West divisions. Um, you know, you you really need to put together – got to get lucky for one. Only one team ends the season happy, right? 29 teams go home mad or sad or whatever. Um, but So you got to get lucky at the right time. you got to get hot at the right time. Uh, like the Phillies this year when Canadian Rob Thompson led in the World Series. I mean, they were the last team into the playoffs, and they went to Game 6 of the World Series. Uh, mm-hmm. They got hot at the right time and just rode their wave and did very, very well. Um, but, you know, the Mets, have, the Mets have tried this before. The Mets have spent a ton of money in other years, and they finished 500. Um, so I think it's one of those things where the owner, the owners always should try to get the best players and always should try to win. And they'll always tell you they are. Um, But yeah, I mean, discrepancy between, you know, you look at Tampa Bay or Oakland or Cincinnati or Pittsburgh, you know, those teams just, they're not, you look at what they did in the off season. They didn't do anything. They didn't spend big, big dollars on anyone. Um, You know, and so they can tell sort of where they're heading and uh, which is unfortunate, but again, you know, Tampa Bay in, in our, in my blue Jay division, you know, I'll, I'll gladly send your Oakland division because they drive us crazy up here in Toronto because Tampa Bay always has a good team and their payroll is is nothing, you know, and, and, and they always play the Jays well and they're always a good team. And, um, you know, so you draft well, you develop well. And, and uh, you know, it'll be interesting if the Mets come together. 
you know, you got a whole bunch of superstars in one clubhouse. Sometimes that doesn't gel right. And uh, other times, I'm saying that now, the Mets are probably going to win 120 games this year. <laughs> Improving. Yeah. Year. But, you know, it's it's a tough call. Money doesn't buy championships. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You got to have a well-rounded team. And I mean, you mentioned Tampa, like, you know, they've, they've gotten away with it because it, you could make the argument they might have the best scouting staff in all of pro sports, let alone just Major League Baseball. And I just wish that I really still feel like baseball should institute a salary floor. It's weird to me. The NHL has a minimum salary floor and Major League Baseball, which dwarfs it in revenue, doesn't. And, and it frustrates me when a guy like John Fisher in Oakland, he's worth three and a half billion dollars and we've got a 22 million dollar payroll i know you can't keep up with uncle steve like (laughs) i I get it but matt chapman and matt olson should still be playing for the oakland a's come on john help me out here with the get you're selling enough gap sweaters come on all right we like chapman in toronto we like chapman at third base for us and i do too because i'm a big (laughs) jace fan as well and i was so so happy chris remember i had the crystal ball i called it i said you called it i said two years ago that Chapman was going to end up in Toronto and he did, which made me happy. And uh, Scott, we really appreciate you doing this. June 17th is induction day for the 2023 class at the Canadian baseball hall of fame in St. Mary's. If you've never been, go give them a visit, Scott. We always appreciate your time, my friend. Thanks so much for doing this and best of luck with induction day this year. Perfect. Thanks for having me on Ryan and Chris. Give me a call anytime and we'll, we'll do this again. Absolutely, we will, my friend. All right, we'll take one last quick break. When we come back, got to talk about the Super Bowl, the big game coming up this Sunday. I got some bets to lay down. Clarky's going to have to uh, maybe hitch his wagon to my bets here. I don't know. Maybe Clarky get you involved in some Super Bowl bets here. We'll see. Coming up next here on Instigating. <laughs> Back to wrap things up here on Instigating with Clarky and Drury this week. Thanks again to our wonderful sponsors, Cool Bet Canada, our friends at Larry Hudson's hey, Chevrolet guess what I got? GMC. Yes, tell me. I got a new truck. You got a new truck? No I way. Did. Dude, you've been on vacation. How'd you? What are you doing over <laughs> the day, here? The day back, I got a new truck. Oh, my God. I got wow. a new truck. Okay. Tell yeah, me all I about it. I had a nice terrain, but I, I, I got a new truck. Uh, my desk is... <laughs> I got one of those raising desks and I just pushed the wrong button. There we go. It's coming back now. It's Uh, coming back. I got a, uh, I got a new truck. I got an elevation, GMC elevation. Nice. Elevation. 22 elevations. It's got the 2.7 liter turbo in it. And uh, so far the gas mileage has been very good and I'm happy with it. It's, it's a different color. You know how you you see white and black everywhere. I, I got a color called sand dune and it's like a tan color. I like it. Blue was my first. I'm into choice. that. Okay, it's like leaf blue, dynamic blue. We call it, but um, there was none available. So I, 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 I'm really liking the sand dune, and everyone who's seen it has liked it. Um, and oh, I okay. just like having a truck again. But we're still clearing out the uh, canyons and Colorados as well. The 22s. Um, we're offering uh, free winter tires, five hundred dollar gas card, and a thousand dollars off. MSRP. So come on in. If you have a sales rep, ask for them. If not, you can ask for Clarky, like Grandpa Bill did. Absolutely. Like Grandpa Bill did. Remember, Hudson's has it. 1000 Wallace Avenue here in beautiful Listville. Uh, dude, you got a new truck. Why don't you come pick me up? Take me for a drive. Yeah, I, 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 I like, want to see I this like driving thing. it. So. Yeah, I'm no, glad. I'm glad you got one called Sand Dune because it fits your crusty personality. You know how you get sand and you say, th- "Yeah, it's perfect for you, man." Get a leaf <laughs> sticker on there. It's so crusty. Man. No, I am putting not, my man. leaf sticker on the back window for sure. It's going on. Beautiful, yeah. man. Well, congrats. Yeah. New truck. And if you want yeah. a new truck, visit our friends at Larry Hudson's here in Listowel. And of course, we're brought to you as always by our friends at Listowel Squash Courts. Uh, find them on Facebook. They got a website. Get involved. Uh, our buddy Alan will hook you up. Our friends at Cool Bet, remember, Super Bowl coming up on Big Sunday. weekend. Big weekend. It is the greatest betting weekend in North American sports. I've got my bets in. I can't wait. It's going to be a huge game. Before we touch on some of my bets that I've thrown I want to predict who you're going to pick. You're okay, going to say yeah. the Eagles. You're going to pick the Eagles, right? I have picked the Eagles. Yeah, I have picked I the Eagles to cover. Yeah. yeah. I don't think so. 
Yeah, here's the thing, right? It's like it's one of those great Super Bowl matchups where I really hope that the game is as good as the matchup looks, right? Mm -hmm. Because Mm -hmm. you got two teams here. It it, Look, it could go either way, and that's what's so great about it. The spread is at one and a half. Yeah, like Vegas. Vegas thinks this is going to be a low. And and I agree. Here's the thing. It's hard to bet against Patrick Mahomes. He's Patrick Mahomes. Wonky ankle. Don't love their defense when I look at Philly's defense. Philly has a way better pass rush. They are going to bother that wonky ankle. And remember, Kansas City has a very, very banged up receiving core. Uh, I don't know if we're going to see a lot of McCole Hardman. I don't know how healthy Juju Smith-Schuster is with that shoulder you know, problem. Yeah, He's still got Travis incre- Kelsey, but... The incredible thing, though, Super Bowl is like the freezings go in the shoulders and everyone seems to be... Uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll see what happens. yeah there, will, it happens. there will be... There will be some toward all yeah. usage, I'm sure, as much as yeah. they don't want to admit that. Look, Clark, Casey, we've talked... I say Casey. You like Casey. You want okay, to, are well, we going to predict the score here? Or? So we absolutely will. But before we get to yeah, a yeah, score yeah. prediction in my bets, I got to ask you something, dude. We talk a lot about media. We are media members. And and I you've been in the media a long time. I You know, I cover the Thanks. OHL. Listen, you have you have you, you legitimately have. I. I know that, you know, we like to stick up for, you know, our side of things and obviously media (laughs) coverage is important, but when you see something like this get asked at Super Bowl media day, it really makes you wonder why players even bother doing interviews. This was a question that was posed to Philadelphia Eagles head coach, Nick Sirianni at Super Bowl media day. This was one of the first three questions he got. Nick Sirianni was just asked who on the Eagles he wouldn't let date his daughter. His response was, my daughter's five. <laughs> like, uh, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Like, what? Like, do some homework if you're going to ask the question. Okay. What are we doing? Like, yeah. Google exists. And also, even if his daughter was 25. Come on. That's <laughs> a fun question on media day, though. Oh, like, media I day. Can't... Media Day in the CFL is kind of the same. Jim Hunt, the old shaky, as his nickname was, I worked with him for years, is his first question on every Media Day for the Grey Cup for 25, 30 years was, are you going to allow your players to have have sex this week? That was the first question. And I think someone has carried that tradition on for shaky since he's passed away. But anyway, yeah, Yeah. it's it's a different, it's a different, it's not like, you know, preparing for the game it's it's more fun questions but anyway okay that one's stupid just I because so. the daughter's five years old <laughs> yeah okay so all right before i rattle my bets off because remember yeah. our friends at cool bet have the best odds in the industry and i love the bet builder tool and i've got four bet builders here that i've thrown down you can join me they're all ten dollar bets clarky score yeah. prediction um i say 24 21 Last minute field goal for KC to win. Interesting. So you like Harrison Bucker to kick a last minute uh, field goal to win it. I think I'm going to go 35 30 for the Eagles. Hmm. Uh, I I just, I think it's going to be a high scoring game. So uh, I've laid down a couple bets here. One I really like in particular here. You can really play around with the player props. That's my favorite thing to do. I've Mm -hmm. got over 51 and a half points for the game, obviously, 35-30. I've got Jarek McKinnon to score any time for Kansas City, as well as Travis Kelsey. They will get on the board and... That will be as close as they get, though. I don't think that they have enough. I've also got another one here that I really like. Jalen Hurts, who is one of the best, if not the best, scrambling quarterback in the league. Him to score a touchdown anytime. Travis Kelsey on this ticket as well to score anytime. You know Travis Kelsey's catching a touchdown in the Super Bowl. I like Eagles to obviously cover the one-and-a-half-point spread, 35-30 winners, and over the 51 and a half $10 bet there on both those gets you 150 and $170 respectively. Let's just hope it's a good game. 
I hope so too, because you know, when you That's see two want. good like games that are that, that good and the two teams in the Super Bowl are good teams, but yeah. you, know, you remember a few years back when Peyton, like that first Super Bowl with the Broncos and they played Seattle and Seattle beat them like 54 to three or something. The Super like, Bowls for years were terrible. For years, they were terrible. They're a lot Some of them lately. have been bad. A lot, lot, yeah. lot better lately. The last five or six years yeah. have been banger after banger yeah. for different now, reasons. What are you doing? Do you have a Super Bowl party to go to? What are you yes. doing on Sunday? You do. Where is the yes. party? Going to a party in Kitchener. Kate's friends okay. host a great Super Bowl party every year. We've Beautiful. gone the last two years running. Okay. We're going to go wings, pizza, the whole deal, maybe a nice. couple of beverages. And uh, it's going to be a great time, man. I love the Super Bowl. Even though my Patriots aren't dominating it anymore, I still love to watch the game. It's the best. And I know that everybody out there, you love to watch. If you want to lay some heat down, do it with our friends at Cool Bet. They are the best. I love the bet builder. All right, Clarky, what a great show. James Power of Goalie Monster Canada. Visit his site if you'd like to maybe invest in adding to your collection with a custom painted old school goalie mask. Get you a Palmateer, a Colzig, a Wah. You do. Clarky, you need a co- you need a you need a Palmateer caps mask and all you get is palmateer leaves mask i think that would be pretty cool i i (laughs) think that that would be cool mikey palms did play for my boys way back in the day i didn't get to watch my chagrin but yeah yes absolutely he's a good capital he's a good capital remember you want a new truck now's the time to go get one visit our friends at larry hudson's here in listowel and visit our friends at the listowel squash courts as well and we appreciate our friend scott crawford of the canadian baseball hall of fame for chatting about induction week this year that's it for us here at instigating we'll be back next week enjoy the super bowl